Welcome to a brief introduction to the technique and principles behind thin layer chromatography. I'm Professor Davis from ChemSurvival.com and the YouTube channel ChemSurvival. Let's get started. Now you can't really have a conversation about chromatography without first having a conversation about Mikhail Svet. Svet was a researcher working in Russia on his second PhD when he made a very interesting observation. He was working with plant pigments and he discovered that he could dissolve many plant pigments in relatively low polarity organic solvents. But he noted that when he added one more thing to the system things changed. He added insoluble plant material like cellulose fibers and when he did that he noted that the solubility of the compounds that he was working with changed drastically. This is a very interesting observation. He could affect the solubility of compounds simply by adding an insoluble material to the solution. This was a very curious observation and it may not seem obvious now but in just a moment I'm going to explain to you how Tzvet turned this into the most powerful separation technique that chemists have in their entire arsenal. So Tzvet had made a very interesting observation that solutes tend to jump back and forth between an insoluble solid phase and a liquid phase above it. But the real utility of his observation comes when we introduce a second compound to the equation. Recall that when he added a high polarity compound to a solvent with plant material in it like cellulose that's insoluble, that that high polarity compound tended to stick very strongly to that material and not be dissolved very much. But if we introduce a compound of lower polarity, it has less of an affinity for that polar compound and therefore will spend more of its time dissolved in solution. But notice that these are equilibrium processes. We call this equilibrium partitioning and it has to do with how strongly a compound adheres to a solid phase versus how well it dissolves in a liquid phase. In our case here, the high polarity compound favors the solid phase whereas the low polarity compound favors the liquid phase. But how do we translate this into a separation technique? <clears throat> the answer to that question is we have to get that liquid phase in motion. So instead of having just a pool of liquid sitting on top of a solid, let's instead have that liquid moving across the surface of the solid. We're going to call that flowing liquid our mobile phase and we're going to call that stationary solid our stationary phase. Now let's add that high polarity compound to the system and see how it behaves. Remember that the high polarity compound spends much of its time adhered to the silica and very little of its time dissolving into that flowing mobile phase. So when we release this compound and let nature take its course, notice that it spends a great deal of its time stuck to the silica and therefore is moving very, very slowly across the screen. So slowly that I have to say something else just to keep up with the time. Done. Now let's change that. Let's instead add a low polarity compound. Remember the lower polarity compound spent a much greater deal of its time dissolved in the liquid phase and less of its time adhered to the silica. So when I release this low polarity compound, and let nature take its course, let's see what happens. Uh, notice it's moving much more rapidly across that stationary phase than its more polar counterpart did. So now let's add a mixture of both to the same point on that plate. And again, release it and let nature take its course. What do we expect to see happen here? Well, of course, they move at different rates and therefore they become separated in space very quickly from one another. This is the essential principle on which chromatography relies. Compounds with greater affinity for the stationary phase will move more slowly than compounds with greater affinity for the mobile phase. And therefore, if we have them all start in the same location, they're going to end up in different locations. And that, my friends, is the definition of separation. <clears throat> If you're taking an organic chemistry course for the first time, your first exposure to chromatography will almost certainly be this, TLC or thin layer chromatography. 
In this technique, we use a glass or plastic backed plate covered in a very thin layer of silica, which is essentially very, very tiny glass beads. So it's a highly polar surface. But how exactly does that surface help us to separate compounds in the lab? Well, we have to take a few steps, obviously, to make this happen. The first is we need to mark our starting lane so we know exactly where we're placing our samples when they begin. We do this using pencil because many inks actually have organic compounds in them as pigments and those organic pigments will chromatograph with everything else and we don't want that to be part of our experiment of course. We mark it about one centimeter above the bottom of the plate so that when we dip the plate into a shallow pool of mobile phase we don't submerge the spots. We've got to be sure that it's higher than the mobile phase pool because if it's not then the chromatography experiment is going to fail. We have to be sure that our compound only has two options, either dissolve into migrating mobile phase or stay adhered to the plate. Dissolving into the mobile phase pool can't be an option. The next step in the process is to apply our compounds to the plate. Now this is often done using small glass capillaries which we can fill with solutions of our compounds in a volatile solvent such as methanol. We use open-ended capillaries so that we can draw the liquid in through capillary action and also expel it from the capillary simply by touching it to the surface of the silica plate. So I'm going to spot one compound here on the left side of my plate. I'll spot my other compound here in the middle of the plate. And just for demonstration purposes, I'm going to perform what's known as a spike, which is I'm going to spot a mixture of both solutions on the plate as well. So now I have very thin layers or very small spots of my compound on the thin layer of silica. These spots have to be very small. The smaller they are, the better they are. You can make them more concentrated by tapping the capillary to them several times and allowing the spot to dry in between those. It's important that they be at least one full spot diameter apart from one another and away from the edge of the plate. This is because as the chromatography experiment progresses, these spots naturally tend to expand a little bit because of diffusion. Now we're about ready to run our chromatography experiment. We're ready to do what's called developing the plate. And to develop the plate, we submerge just the very bottom of the plate in a very thin pool of our liquid mobile phase. When we do this, that liquid mobile phase will begin to migrate up the plate, just like water being sucked up into a paper towel that's been dipped into a pool of water. As that flowing mobile phase moves up the plate, it will encounter the spots. And at this point, the spots have a choice. They can spend more of their time dissolved in the flowing mobile phase, or more of their time adhered to the highly polar silica stationary phase. And as this happens, the spots migrate. Now notice that I've stopped my plate with the mobile phase about three quarters of the way to the top. I can't let my mobile phase reach the top as we're about to see because there's a very important calculation I need to perform. At this point, my plate is finished developing. I have to quickly mark that solvent front because if I don't mark it rapidly, that solvent will eventually evaporate and it's very difficult to detect where it was at all. So now I have a developed TLC plate. And I can clearly see that my yellow compound has moved farther than my purple compound. So my yellow compound must be less polar. But we prefer to have a more quantitative way of describing how these compounds move. Mikhail Zweck gave this technique its name chromatography. And we can see why now because of the Greek words for color and writing. but we need to quantify exactly how our spots moved. To simply say that one moved farther than the other doesn't tell the entire story. We do this using measurements of the distance traveled by the solvent itself and the distance traveled by the samples, measuring from the starting lane to the center of the spot. These give me some numerical values that I can use to assign a number to the mobility of a compound instead of simply saying one's more mobile than the other. We call this number a retention factor, RF. And it's calculated using the distance traveled by our sample divided by the distance traveled by the solvent. So for example, let's say that my purple compound here has traveled 
2.2 centimeters, while my solvent front traveled 11 centimeters. I can calculate the RF by dividing 2.2 by 11, leading to a numerical value of 0 0.2. Similarly, I can calculate the distance traveled by my yellow compound divided by the distance traveled by the solvent, giving me an RF factor of 0 0.8. As you can see, a higher RF actually means a more mobile compound. But not only that, I know exactly how far these compounds should move in this chromatographic system. So if I repeat my experiment, I can expect to get the same RF values. This makes chromatography much more useful for describing sample mobility as well as for identification purposes. This is how the technique is performed. I hope you guys have a great time running your first chromatography experiments in your organic labs. Good luck with it. I'm Professor Davis from ChemSurvival.com, YouTube channel ChemSurvival. I'll see you on the next video.